What is the minimum amount of gear that you need to create good photography? Well, in terms of film photography, you need a lens, a camera body, and a roll of film. With just a little bit of money, you can get a good lens, a camera with fully manual controls, which is preferable, and the film stock of your choice, and create awesome photography. This $15 EOS Rebel G is a perfect example of a setup like that. This was released in September of 1996, intended at the beginner or the hobbyist. I think there are many upsides to this camera, but let's talk about the handful of negatives or downsides first. If you shot a DSLR or any other film SLR, um, most likely you're used to shutter speeds up to one four thousandth or one eight thousandth of a second. Um, this only has shutter speeds up to one two thousandth of a second which really isn't that big a deal for a lot of photography that you might be doing. But if you do use those higher shutter speeds, you're gonna be, you're gonna feel a little handicapped with this. Now, in context, if you compare this to film cameras from the 1960s, 70s, and early 80s, one two thousandths was pretty good, um, considering that most mechanical film cameras had only up to one one thousandth. It wasn't until some of the Nikon cameras and Canon F1, that shutter speed started to increase beyond that. So in, by today's standards, it's, it's a slow max shutter speed, but in context to all the other film cameras out there, it's average. One of the biggest negatives that affected how I shoot was the fact that there is no back button autofocus option on this. Back button autofocus is a customization option on most Canon SLRs, digital and film, that allows you to reprogram which button controls autofocus. It's most by default, it's on the shutter release, but when you switch it from the shutter release to one of the buttons on the back, then you can control autofocus with your thumb. And that way you have shutter release and autofocus separately, which becomes really handy because you can have a little more control over your auto, what subject your autofocus um, dials in on. Not having that was a little bit of a bummer, but I just learned to autofocus with the shutter release button, pushed halfway down, recompose if I need to, and then take the shot. So all in all, not really a big deal. One of the bigger negatives, if you're a portraiture photographer or a photographer that uses flash for any reason, is that this has a low sync speed. I'm not a flash photographer for the most part, I dabble in some things and I'm using those a little more, but um, my main thing is street, city scenes, and landscape photography. So most of my work is natural light. In the situations where I do use artificial light, most of the time I'm using constant lighting because I need uh, that adaptability between stills and video. But if flash photography is your thing, then this may not be the camera for you. I will cover other models that don't cost don't that don't cost that much more that give you a lot more flexibility. So flash sync speed is uh, probably one of the biggest negatives. One of the more interesting downsides or negatives to this camera is the way that the film roll loads. Normally, when you put a roll of film in here, it loads on the spool this way. It takes a shot and goes this direction. And when the whole roll is shot on this side, it automatically rewinds back into the film can on this side after the whole roll is shot. This camera does the opposite. As soon as you put the roll in and close the door, it loads the whole roll of film onto this side and basically shoots the roll backwards. So your exposure counter is backwards and the, the film roll is shooting backwards. Once you're shooting, you don't really know, it doesn't make that big a deal for the most part, but Having the exposure count read backwards is a little uh, uh, is a little weird, so that takes a little bit of getting used to. And the other thing is that now you have all the film over here. If by some chance you open the back door, all this gets exposed to light. As were before, if you only had a little bit of the film roll rolled out and you accidentally open the door, only what's outside of the can gets exposed to light. So you still could shoot the rest of this roll and be okay. So that reverse loading situation is something to keep in mind, something to get used to.
and is one of the few downsides I thought were worth mentioning. And the other thing that's on the downside of this camera is build quality. The There's a core part to the body that feels fairly solid, but everything from the door to the top to even the shutter release button feels um, kind of loose and noticeably plastic. Kind of sounds silly, I guess, but when you consider that uh, Canon does make a lot of cameras that are that, that have a lot of plastic on them, but yet they feel sturdy, well-made, and uh, durable. And then this one does not. This definitely feels like plastic um, and light, which brings me to the group of uh, positives, which for a $15 camera, I think it's mostly upsides. So bouncing off the idea that this is made of plastic, the upside to that is that it is super light and compact. I don't have the Canon 40 millimeter pancake lens, but I have to imagine that with that on here, this might be about as small as you can get for 35 millimeter autofocus SLR. Once you go into rangefinders and whatnot, obviously you get to, you can get to smaller compact situations. But for interchangeable lens, autofocus SLR, this might be one of the smallest ones out there. I'm not sure. Okay, another positive of this camera was a, actually a big surprise to me was the fact that it has an exposure scale in the viewfinder. So almost every DSLR has this now, so we're all accustomed to it and very used to it. But not all cameras had this back in the day. Um, even when cameras went from metal, mechanical, non-autofocus, manual focus cameras to the body form factors that we're used to now, even then not all of them had exposure scales. For example, my Canon A2E is an awesome camera. I love that camera. But the American version of the camera doesn't have an exposure scale. So when you dial in exposure and you lock it on, it gives you an indicator that you're locked on, but there's no scale to see how far you're off if you are off so you can uh, appropriately overexpose or underexpose, underexpose if you choose to. Obviously you can over underexpose on, on that camera, but uh, you don't have that scale to guide you. Scale is very nice because it gives you almost a visual representation of the zone system, if you're familiar with that. You can see when you're the middle, you're locked on uh, exposure on that point that you're exp you're metering, and you can see how far left or right that you're that you're over or under. So that's a very handy tool to have, and it helps helps to learn exposure. But it's also a tool that I love to use all the time. So I get very used to using that. I love cameras that have it, and surprisingly, this one does. Granted, since it is a small viewfinder, the exposure scale is much smaller than what's on my EOS three, for example, but the fact that it's there was a nice surprise for a $15 camera. I would say that the fact that you can control this camera completely manually is an upside, but at the same time, it's almost a minimum for me. For the most part, I don't really care to buy any camera that doesn't have the option for fully manual controls. Those cameras are few and far between, but there are a few out there that are geared specifically towards beginners or people that don't want to be bothered with any of that stuff. They just want to point and shoot and that's it. Thankfully, this camera does have the option for manual controls. And for the most part, it works like any other Canon EOS camera. The dial above the shutter release button controls the shutter speed. And for this camera to uh, control the aperture, you push the button, one of the buttons on the back, and then turn the same dial. So being able to control manually control shutter speed and aperture is really obviously all you need. The other cool thing about this camera um, is the fact that the viewfinder shows you what shutter speed and aperture setting you're at at that moment. This again sounds obvious to most cameras that we have now, but in the history of Canon film cameras, not every film camera that they released had that information in the viewfinder. So if you were shooting manually and you had the camera up to your eye, unless you remember exactly where you set the, 
those settings at, you didn't always know where you were at at that moment. You had to pull the camera down and look at it to see what my aperture setting is, or what my shutter speed setting is. Not a huge deal, but again, anything that helps me keep my eye to the viewfinder is a big bonus, and having that information in the viewfinder is what I like to have, and again, this $15 camera has that. The lens I have on this now is the Canon 50mm 1.8, the STM version. This is the latest version of, of what they call the Nifty 50. Um, both Canon and Nikon make a quote unquote entry level 50 millimeter lens and this is Canon's latest version of that. I'm probably going to make a video on that although this is there's probably a thousand videos on the Nifty 50 but that's for good reason. It's probably the best bang for your buck um, for photography and even to a certain extent video and filmmaking if you use DSLRs for that. The Nifty 50 is about $125 brand new but can produce images that are absolutely stunning. But you can obviously mount any other EF lens on this camera. Uh, obviously EF-S lenses won't work but standard EF lenses will. So if you have a collection of EF glass then you can get a $15 body and be up and running with film photography. This is the lower end of that EF film, EOS film lineup, but again, even the $15 version can get you going and without, with very few compromises for the most part. Continuing with the upsides, I mean, affordability is the biggest upside of this. That's, that's the whole reason that I wanted to make the video on this camera because it is only around $15 on the used market. I wanted to see what you could do with it, what the limitations were, uh, so affordability is number one on the positive list of this camera. You could buy two or three of them and have backups or have a zoom lens on one and a wide angle on another and give yourself a lot of choices. You don't have to worry about breaking it for the most part because again, you could go out and find another one pretty, pretty easily. So affordability and the freedom that that allows you is a huge bonus. In the mechanical, manual focus camera world, there are a handful of uh, camera models that are staples, so to speak. That every film photography has heard of or a lot of film photographers have started with. The Pentax K1000 is one of the ones that comes to mind. A lot of film photography classes will, will recommend this, the K1000 to start with, for a lot of reasons. One is price, because that is pretty affordable. There's a ton of them, there was a ton of them made. They were making them up until the 2000s, I think. Um, so you'll see K1000s out there all the time. This camera, I think, uh, still is, is in that spirit of a cheap camera that has fully manual controls, but the difference between this and the K1000 is well, for one, it uh, has autofocus, obviously. The other thing that I love and my whole purpose for doing these videos is the fact that it is a cousin to the modern Canon DSLRs, so they can share lenses. So you're not, you, so you don't invest in a film camera that's isolated in your own camera uh, system or your own collection of gear. You can get one that you can use other lenses on. The EOS Rebel G has the essential elements that you need to create cool photography. You have manual control over shutter, you have manual control over aperture. Obviously you have the ability to autofocus if you choose, but you can use uh, you can use manual focus as well. It has an awesome metering system, which I hadn't mentioned before. I should cover that real quick. So although it doesn't have spot metering, which is my preference most of the time to meter with, it has partial metering, which in this case, on this camera, is about 9% of the frame, which is pretty much that small circle in the center of the viewfinder. Uh, so you can you can point that to what you need to meter on, and, and in this situation, you press this button down on the back, it does the partial metering for that situation, and then you can uh, adjust accordingly from there. And the cool thing is you can press that button and meter in a few different spots 
get a mental average of what the exposure is and, and, and make your choices based on that. If you're using the camera in any sort of auto mode, the partial metering option isn't there, but I always use these in manual mode, manual exposure mode, so I try to have the smallest metering option that I can so I can control exactly what, what I want to use for the light meter. It does have three metering modes. It has evaluative metering, which is the default mode for the most auto program modes on the camera. It has center weighted average metering, which is the default mode for manual operation. And you click that button on the back and you enter the third metering mode, which is the partial metering. So by default is center weighted metering when you're in manual mode, but you can turn on that partial metering mode by that clicking that button on the back. I'd seen this camera online a lot and I was curious of, uh, of what it could do. Um, I was pleasantly surprised at a few things with it, mainly the, the exposure meter and the fact that uh, it's easy, it's fairly easy to operate manu uh, manually. Um, I like the idea of getting these cheap cameras and pushing the limits of them. One of my favorite things about the world of film photography is the fact that the camera body plays a minimal role in picture quality. The picture quality in film photography comes from the lens and the film stock and the creative choices that, that you make. So in this case, that Nifty 50 I've put on there, I, you can find a Nifty 50 for around 75 bucks on the used market. So with this $15 Ripple G and a $75 Nifty 50, you can produce killer images and be started in film photography really, really cheap and then upgrade your camera body later. Okay, so this is the first video on my line of US film camera reviews or overviews. Um, I'm not sure which one I'll post next, but leave me a comment if you have the Rebel G or if you wanna see another US film camera uh, reviewed or talked about, and then I'll try to find it and try to shoot with it. So again, please like and subscribe, go back and watch any other video I've posted, and find me on Instagram if you're there too. Talk to you soon.